G'day everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar to discuss transitioning from soils to substrates in strawberry production. Uh, we've had a great level of interest in this topic and uh, looking forward to talking it through with you today. It's something we've been observing at a national level, uh, a bit of a trend as a greater number of growers are either making or looking at making the transition from soil based production to substrates across the national strawberry industry. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to having a chat with a couple of growers today who have varying degrees of experience um, and very different substrate production systems in place. My name is Clinton Muller. I work with RM Consulting Group. We coordinate the National Strawberry Research and Development Extension Program, Strawberry Innovation, which is funded by the Strawberry Levy Fund with co-contribution from the Australian Government through Hort Innovation. Um, I'm also joined by the two industry development officers for this with this project Anderson in the temperate region and Jennifer Rowling in the subtropical region. We're also very fortunate to be joined by our speakers today, which include uh, Marcus Van Heist from Priva, Oceana. Production of what considerations are needed to make the transitions from soils to substrates. Uh, we're also looking forward to hearing from Laura Wells uh, from Taste and Sea in Queensland. Laura and the family there have just completed their second season uh, on open air tabletops and have some good lessons to share from that experience, as does the team from Sunny Ridge in Victoria. So we're joined by the Yellingbow Operations Manager, Scott Carter, as well as Gabby Yasinov, an agronomist with Sunny Ridge. Um, those guys have a long history of growing in substrates under table tunnels. Just before we get started, a bit of housekeeping for those who have not joined a webinar before. This is a one hour discussion that's being recorded and be made available later on the Strawberry Innovation website. Uh, for your viewing pleasure as many times as you like and to sharing for those who weren't able to join with us today. But for those of you who are joining us live, we'd really encourage you to participate uh, and welcome your questions. So you can ask questions a couple of ways. Um, probably the best way is by typing into the GoToWebinar toolbar under questions. Uh, we'll save up some questions for Q&A and a discussion at the end. If you're not up for typing questions though, we've got Jen and Angela on the line. I'll throw up their numbers shortly. So feel free to give them a call on your, their mobile um, and they'll read out your question on your behalf. Um, but we've got Scott Carter and Gabby Yasinov from Sunny Ridge uh, joining us. So Scott, if I could invite you to tell us a bit more about your production system uh, you've got there at Sunny Ridge operation. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so Sunny Ridge has essentially four quite large farms, uh, one in Queensland, uh, one at Bonio and one in Main Ridge, which are both down on the peninsula. And then we've got the farm that myself and Gabby are on is uh, in the Yarra Valley. Um, to let you know a bit more about our operation here, we have 27 hectares uh, in the field strawberries, soil grown. We have four hectares of blueberries, which is substrate. And we have 18 hectares of raspberries, of which uh, 11 and a half are hydro grown. Um, so what we've done at this farm, we've we've definitely got soil. We've got quite clay heavy soil, um, which obviously has drainage issues. Um, and we've this winter we converted uh, 15 and a half hectares to hydro substrate production. Um, we had one hectare last year of um, hydroponic raspberries. Um, and we have no substrate or hydroponic strawberries at the current point in time. Uh, Fantastic. And and how, how are things travelling along with the production system? Are there any lessons to date from some of the other farms that you're looking at applying at the Yellingbo site? Um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's quite a few lessons to, I think, that we have learned you know, over the over the years, and and myself and Gabby as well with substrate, um, and that includes really just setting it up properly. Um, so we were quite quite lucky um, in our hydro design and substrate that I've you know we've got Daniel and Orland from from Bonio who have you know set it up and done hydro strawberries you know for the last uh, three or four years. So there's always good tips and tricks you know as around design, making sure flow rates are a right efficiency test on drippers, you know, valve block sizes, um, as far as actual, you know, hydroponic and, and dosing systems. We've, 
we've set up quite a well, very simple basic system, uh, which is just based around Dosatrons. Um, but we will be looking to upgrade that next year. Okay, fantastic. And maybe um, Gabby might have a chance to comment on some of those changes in the horizon. So what, some of those experiences from the other production sites was going into some of the new greenfield developments on the other farms. Hi, hello guys. Uh, thank you very much for joining the webinar. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, as Scott mentioned before, we have a lot of experience. I bring experience also from a country where I study. I'm originally from Israel. Now, as a part, as everybody probably noticed, the global warming, and it's getting harder and harder to start growing soil. In Israel, for example, there is no almost crops that growing in open field. It's just impossible. Uh, soil is getting worse. Uh, there is a lot of disease. Uh, we can mention like chakra oil and uh, pitophthora, pitium, marginaria, you name it. So the smart, smart change is to move to hydroponics, to substrate production. Uh, mostly we do with coir, like Scott mentioned before. Um, I think it's, uh, of course, you need more uh, to spend more time with the crops, but the efficiency is much better. It's intensive. And the, the yield, uh, as a result, is and the quality is uh, rising uh, dramatically. And Gabby, I guess given your unique experience as well, coming from an international perspective from Israel, is there any other shared lessons you find from what's happening globally and what trends are emerging? Yeah, every, uh, look, it depends. It's uh, it's interesting. Everybody wants to move to hydroponics. That's for sure, for the reason I mentioned before. The question is how. In colder climates, we're talking about glass production uh, that's working pretty well for cold areas like Canada or United States or North Europe, Holland, let's say. And um, in Israel, it's mostly, or here, because it's a warm climate, it's pretty similar to here, more like Queensland, Sydney, Queensland. But open field, uh, not open. Uh, I'm talking about substrate under the tunnels instead of open fields. This is what is working, and of course, the the higher, the bigger the tunnels you have, it's better for airflow and the more efficient production. And this is what we try to implement here as well. Based on, we have a lot of growers from all around the seas. I think Sunny Ridge gathered the best grower from all around the world. Scott and from New Zealand. I'm from. Uh, Israel, we have growers from Eastern Europe, England, uh, Mexico, and this is what everybody talking about on the same page. Okay, fantastic. And I guess from all that experience you've got there at Sunny Ridge with the, um, the international experience in particular, are there any sort of particular lessons going into new developments that you will do differently given what you know now about the production system? Uh, what I know is uh, that uh, maybe glass houses, not like I mentioned before, not suited for the whole uh, hot weather. Me and Scott, we had experience in one company, and it, we grow Albion and glass houses, and it was very, very challenging. We bring good results, uh, but it's really, really hard work, especially in the glass houses. Everything becomes intensive, really hard to control the disease, and really hard to control the insects. But I wouldn't recommend on this system here. Uh, I would, uh, as I said, high tunnels, or even. I know that uh, some growers that trying the system uh, uh, like open like tabletops, even without coverage, it also might work with strawberry. Uh, I, I don't know enough about this specifically. I didn't see it, but uh, this is, might work here, for my opinion. Yeah, we're more yeah. experienced with high tunnels. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Look, it's really interesting to hear about that experience and moving from your existing tunnel structures to the high tunnels there at Sunny Ridge. Um, apologies again, everyone, for the challenges earlier. Um, we're going to try again <laughs> to um, throw the screen back to poor Marcus, who's hanging in there very well at the moment. So Marcus, we'll try again to see if we can um, bring up your screen, which has appeared. I think we're on track and that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, floor's all yours, Marcus, and thanks for your patience. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it was good to hear from Scott and Gabby with some practical experiences. Um, uh, yeah, so what I uh, got to was uh, just some some challenges, which um, uh, Scott and Gabby actually also pointed out. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, the weather, which um, is uh, is something that's a challenge for for any grower, um, and another reason to consider uh, substrate production. Um, then um, 
the uh, one thing that's um, that's probably uh, not very commonly mentioned, but uh, something that I think is uh, also very important to consider is uh, the uh, the challenges and the uh, potential savings in labour when you um, consider uh, substrate production. Um, there was some some research done on uh, soil versus substrate labour costs, and um, you can see um, that. Uh, um, you know, your, your labour savings are, are quite significant when and these are European uh, figures, um, I have to admit, but uh, the, um, when you consider the labour costs over there per hour to, compared to what we pay here, I think these figures will only be amplified in, uh, in, in Australia. You can see there's significant um, savings when you go from, uh, from tabletop uh, out of soil production. The, um, Sorry, my uh, presentation is jumping around a bit. Um, so the next thing to, to um, uh, consider also the uh, potential um, uh, disease risks that you have in the soil, which uh, you can um, uh, you, you may be able to avoid by going to substrate production. I've listed some some of the more common ones here. Um, they're um, you know. People like uh, Gabby and Scott will be able to tell a lot more about uh, their experiences with um, substrate versus soil. Uh, just some ideas on or some ways of, of getting into substrate production. Open field, an uh, example here of uh, open field substrate production, which um, Laura will be able to um, uh, tell more about. And then, of course, um, substrate production in tunnels, which um, Gabby and Scott have just mentioned as well. And greenhouse production, which as Gabby's already pointed out, it's it's not necessarily the uh, the best solution everywhere, but there are uh, in some places, um, uh, particularly uh, in parts of Europe, uh, greenhouse substrate production is extremely common for uh, uh, to produce um, fruit uh, in in the um, colder times of the year. So. In terms of what you should consider if you want to go to substrate production, um, now most of you already have water, of course, in, uh, in soil production, but once you go to substrate, the quality of your water is absolutely paramount. And it's important to look closely at your various water sources. Uh, some of you will have um, maybe just one water source. Uh, some of you will have multiple water sources. Um, and it's important to look at all your water sources and consider the the, the quality and any potential issues that um, may need to be remedied before you use it for irrigation. It is your most important resource when, uh, when you're um, uh, considering substrate production. So uh, some things to consider are quantity and cost of your water, uh, quality in terms of the physical quality, chemical, biological, and in terms of water sources, you can consider rain, bore, channel, river or dam, and then town supply. And then each type of water source can bring with it uh, some, some good points and some bad points. And it's important to consider all those and to see if there's any correction needed before you use it. It's a good idea also to have a water analysis done. Um, with bore water, uh, you, you know, a couple of times a year is plenty, but if you're using um, river or uh, channel water, it's important that you do that more regularly. Um, the analyses will tell you what what uh, is good and what is not so good about your water and what may need correcting before you use it for substrate production. pH. Now pH, as I said, is, isn't necessarily very well understood. Uh, pH is basically a measure of hydrogen ions in your water. Um, the, what many people don't realise is pH is actually logarithmic and that means that the pH of 5 um, contains 10 times more hydrogen ions than a pH of 6. So if you look on a, uh, on a graph of the, um, the uh, concentration of hydrogen ions versus pH, you can see that the, uh, the scale goes up very quickly. And um, this, this adds to the complexity of trying to control pH, which I'll uh, tell you about in a second. The importance of pH is if you get all your fertilizer quantities correct and you've got the right nutrient regime, you've got the right um, irrigation regime, but you fail to um, uh, correct your pH, 
what will happen is you'll find that the, the nutrients in the water, uh, although present in the right concentrations and the right uh, ratios, won't necessarily be available to the plants. So having the pH in the correct range, uh, typically between sort of 5.5 uh, .5 to 6.5 most commonly, um, you can see that that's the range in which the all elements that plants need for growth are readily available. And once you drift too high or too low, um, you are going to notice um, deficiencies or even toxicity of uh, various elements. The other thing that's not commonly understood is bicarbonate. Um, high bicarbonate in, in a concentration in your water uh, doesn't make the water um, unsuitable for irrigation. It just means it needs to be dealt with. And what bicarbonate tends to do is it causes the water to resist uh, correcting the pH. So um, it's a good idea to buffer your water first um, by adding acid. And the thing to remember there is that this reaction takes uh, needs both time and a lot of air to, uh, to complete. So um, direct injection of acid while irrigating may not necessarily lead to uh, the uh, correct control of pH. And if your levels are any higher than one millimole per litre in your source water, then we highly recommend that you pre-treat your water uh, in a holding tank before you use it for irrigation. And this is a, a way, a diagram that shows you a way of pre-treating the water uh, in, in a tank with a suitable pre-treatment unit. So next thing to uh, discuss is um, fertigation. And now I've just shown you here a, a, a little diagram that shows everything a plant needs and the two things that we can control with, with, uh, um, with our water and, and fertilizer, are things that we have the highest control over. The other things we have very little control over. So what are the nutrients that plants need? These are the nutrients, all the nutrients a plant needs. So you've got primary uh, nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, secondary, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and your micronutrients, iron, boron, copper, manganese, zinc, molybdenum, chloride. Um, generally not a great deal of chloride. The, uh, the, they're split into macro and micronutrients, and that just gives an indication of the quantity needed uh, in, in a typical um, recipe for your plants. Now, the proportion of these uh, nutrients will vary with the stage of growth. Typically, plants uh, at early stage, you want a high nitrogen to stimulate uh, veg vegetative production. And later on, you, you want to switch to a higher uh, concentration of potassium to stimulate flowering and fruit production. Now, remembering that uh, plants will, when it comes to uh, nutrition, plants will always be held back by the most limiting factor. So having these nutrients in the right ratio to each other, as well as the right concentration is absolutely critical. Um, in this example here, if nitrogen is limiting, then that will limit the growth, even if all the other nutrients are at the correct levels. So that leads us then to our recipes. And um, the correct recipe is going to be very dependent on the, uh, the, the, the type of crop, the, the, the variety, stage of growth, etc. And um, there are plenty of people with uh, expertise that can you advise, advise you on um, how to, uh, um, how to uh, set up your recipes for your crop. So then how do we inject the fertilizer into our system? Well, we split our nutrients into two stock tanks, uh, an A and a B tank. Your A tank uh, typically contains all your calcium nitrate as well as your iron chelate, and your B tank contains all other fertilizers. Why do we separate the two? Yeah, the reason being is our stock tanks are a concentrate, so typically 100 to 1, so 100 times concentrate. And in that form, the two won't mix um, because the calcium will combine with the sulfates of your B tank and form gypsum, which is the last thing you want to be injecting into your lines. So in, in concentrate form, we need to keep them separated. Obviously, once that um, those stock solutions have been introduced into the irrigation water, uh, it's no longer an issue. Um, 100 to 1 uh, concentrate means that for every 1,000 litres of water we irrigate with, then we typically have 10 litres of your A tank and 10 litres of your B tank um, being injected into that water. 
if we have multiple A and B tanks, then we can have a, um, a system where we have different recipes, obviously with different tanks with different uh, uh, ratio of the fertilizers. Now, ways of injecting those A and B tanks in its very simple form, like uh, Scott just mentioned, you can have a, um, um, a dosatron or dosmatic uh, injectors. They are water-driven injectors, uh, fairly simple. They uh, are a proportional injector. So as the flow rate increases, they'll inject more, more fertilizer. A very easy, relatively simple, cheap way of, of starting off um, and, um, and reasonably accurate uh, way to get started. Then from there, um, once you need more flexibility or you need higher capacities, then you very quickly should be looking at some form of uh, fertigation unit. Um, a typical fertigation unit will have uh, a minimum of three channels, what are called injection channels. So that's one for A, one for B, and one for pH control, which normally means acid. Um, or units will have multiple A and B channels so that you have the option of injecting different recipes for crops that are at different stages um, on, on the property. So a typical system layout may look something like this, where we have our in, uh, in a dosing unit with multiple A and B tanks connected to it, and it will supply both water and fertilizer through a filter and a flow meter out to various blocks. And you can then via your controller determine which block gets which recipe. So if some blocks are uh, in early stages of growth, then they'll get a different recipe to blocks where they are at a later stage of growth and therefore requiring a different recipe. Just some basics on um, irrigation layout. Uh, obviously with substrate production, coca peat is, uh, is probably the most common substrate used. Um, be aware that not all coca peat is created equal. Um, talk to your suppliers and, and um, ask them lots of questions on, on how their coca peat is sourced, um, what the quality is like, what types of um, coca peat materials and blends they can supply, and maybe talk to other growers that have used those same suppliers um, and ask them to share their experiences. Uh, remembering coca peat is an organic product and it is produced from, uh, obviously from um, coconut trees and um, the quality from year to year can vary because of the uh, impact of environment. Um, so the better suppliers will uh, be able to compensate for that by um, uh, adjusting the way they produce their coca peat, whereas maybe some of the poorer suppliers will use um, inferior material. The slabs are typically one meter long. Uh, you typically have approximately eight plants per slab and then you'll arrange them in some form of tabletop layout. This layout may be either single, double or triple. Um, these can be um, um, outside or they can be in a tunnel. If uh, in a tunnel, then typically in a single tabletop layout, you'll have six rows per tunnel, in a tunnel typically being uh, eight to eight and a half meters uh, in span. Uh, if it's double, then it'll be four rows and triples four rows as well. Um, Triple tabletops aren't very common uh, for, for good reason. Um, there's uh, only really, um, um, you have to be fairly careful where you use triples. Probably singles are the most common and doubles would be the second most common uh, setups you'll see. Trippers per uh, slab or bag is typically four, uh, sometimes five, and flow rates per dripper typically around two liters per hour. Make sure your drippers are pressure compensating and also make sure they are anti-drain. Um, not all pressure compensating drippers are anti-drain and what that means is a dripper that's not anti-drain um, when you finish irrigation and the valve closes those drippers will continue to drain until your laterals are empty and that's not good if you're talking about any um, uh, sites where there's some slope involved because what you'll see is the lower end of the, of the blocks will tend to get um, over irrigated so this anti-drain feature is quite important to have. The typical irrigation block size is approximately one hectare per valve. Um, there can be variations of that, but uh, um, and that comes down to uh, the irrigation design. And as Scott says, that's something that's very critical when you're setting up blocks. So 
when you're um, deciding on how to lay out your blocks, you can use a table such as this one where um, the block sizes are set out and the number of um, slabs are set out, the number of plants, the number of drippers, and how many valves you want uh, per block, and then that determines your flow rate per block. What I've done here is I've just compared single, double, and triple tabletop blocks together so you can get an idea of the different flow rates that are um, needed for that type of block and then some idea of how you could split those sort of blocks into different valves to even out your flow rate. One thing that's really critical is uh, for good um, control of uh, your uh, fertilizer injection and of, of pH is to try and keep your block sizes or your, uh, your valve uh, sizes as equal as possible. And that means the number of drippers per valve, keep them as consistent as, co as possible. That gives the system the best chance of maintaining um, good control over EC, which is a, a level of a measure of um, how much fertilizer is in your water um, uh, while it's irrigating your blocks. So this is an idea of how your, your single, double and triple tabletops may look like um, in a tunnel or and don't have to be in a tunnel, can be outside as well. And then the next thing that uh, um, should be considered is how we're going to control our irrigation. So the most basic control you can do is on light. Um, probably the most common you'll find is on time with, uh, sorry, basic control is on time. The most common you'll find these days is time with light. And what that allows you to do is um, have uh, a light influence on your, uh, your irrigation um, uh, intervals. So if it's a bright sunny day, then yeah, the, the system will automatically uh, irrigate more often than if it's a, a cloudy or dull day uh, when the irrigation system will back off on the number of cycles, obviously because the plants don't need as much. Um, further advancements on that are moisture sensors, which measure the moisture level in the slabs, uh, drain sensors, which measure the drain from the slabs. Uh, it is important that uh, when you're irrigating, that you irrigate to some level of drain. Uh, that will make sure that we don't get a buildup of uh, nutrient or salt within the slabs and, and therefore don't create a conditions that um, uh, the plants aren't going to like. Um, the most recent um, developments are in the form of transpiration sensors, which measure the um, uh, water uptake via weight. So with light, you can typically with a controller set your day into different periods and you, um, you typically start your periods um, sometime after sunrise and you may have a mid-morning period from say around about 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and an afternoon period from 1 p.m. to sunset. And within those periods you, you will set a, a, a light accumulation and the way to look at that is uh, the, the brighter or the more sun there is, the faster you'll accumulate light and therefore um, the more frequently the irrigation system will, will um, do its cycles. Um, obviously, conversely, if it's a, a dull day, then you won't accumulate light so much, and so the cycles will be more spread out. The other features that some controllers will have is the ability to also uh, have a light influence on your EC, which is obviously the amount of fertilizer in your water. And what that will do is, on those bright days, is actually automatically reduce the EC of the water that you're irrigating with, uh, and thereby reducing the amount of fertiliser that's being applied. And for the very simple reason is that of, on those days, your plants have a greater need for water than they do fertiliser. So uh, that saves fertiliser and keeps the conditions um, um, in the slabs better for uh, the plants. So then the uh, latest developments have been in some form of transpiration sensors. So what we do here is we uh, continuously measure the um, the, uh, the slabs that the plants are growing in. And um, what we can see then is when there's, for example, a, a one kg loss of uh, weight from those slabs, that equates to a one litre loss. So that's the one litre that obviously needs to be replaced. Um, doing it this way, we uh, automatically take account of other factors which um, uh, a light sensor can't uh, take account of, which are, for example, wind and humidity. On uh, very windy days, uh, plants will transpire more than on uh, less windy days. And on humid days, uh, the opposite happens. Obviously, on a very humid day, plants can't transpire as much and therefore won't need as much water. 
So by um, determining the water loss via the weight, we're taking all those factors into account. And then you'll see this sort of trend occurring where overnight you'll see a gradual decrease in the amount of uh, uh, water that's in those slabs. Um, and then when it reaches a certain critical point, a system will, will start irrigating in, in a stepwise fashion. The reason it does it in stepwise is that we don't want to create anaerobic conditions within those slabs because plants don't just need water and fertilizer, they still need oxygen around the roots um, to be able to function properly. So by doing it in a stepwise fashion, we make sure the conditions remain uh, um, right for the plants. Then uh, once we've reached a, a point where uh, we've reached saturation, then we have a holding uh, um, a, a period through the middle of the day and then towards the end of the day, these, sort of, these systems will automatically dry the plants back so that you don't end up going too wet into the night and then line it up for irrigating next, again the next day. So these systems are available and um, you, know, you can talk to uh, people who can tell you more about those. So if you have the right control, then you'll, you'll get your uh, correct timing, um, your frequency will be right, and uh, you'll also make sure you don't irrigate too long at the end of the day and um, end up going to, into the night with uh, very wet feet, as uh, they call it. Um, this is a, a type of setup where the scales are measuring the weight of um, the, the slabs in, uh, in uh, strawberries growing in tunnels. And that pretty much concludes my presentation. So um, if there are any questions, feel free to shoot those through and uh, we'd be happy to answer them. If you want to know more about um, any systems that we offer, obviously you can jump on our website um, or feel free to call me at any stage. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Marcus. That was a great overview and summary of um, some of the system options. So just in the interest of time, I really appreciate everyone's patience with us as we're um, dealing with the technology today. But I'm just going to try and see if I've got Laura on the line. So I'm Laura. I'm one of the Taste and Sea Strawberry Farms here in Queensland in Balmia. Um, we have been growing strawberries probably, well, my, my family has been growing strawberries for 45 plus years in ground production. Uh, we have been in Belmere for around 27 years growing in that ground and in Wamuran uh, for about eight years, all traditional ground growing. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is all very new for us. We're still definitely just pioneers for this, um, this whole expedition um, and we're learning a lot. But um, yeah, so like I said, we've got a, a property in Belmere, and that is the property that we've actually transitioned now completely into tabletops. So it's about 10 and a half hectares of uh, ground uh, tables grown in open field production. So we, we don't have any tunnels or any of those um, kind of protections or things. So we're, we're basically just trying to do uh, the best we can in, in that situation. So fantastic, Laura. And you know, on the Bellamy property, can you tell us a bit what triggered that change? Why did you guys decide to to make the change and go from infield to the tabletops? Uh, lot, obviously, the biggest thing which everyone spoke about is soil health. So um, we farmed in the same ground for 27 plus years. Uh, we have a very high expectation of quality with our fruit. Uh, we've seen predominantly over the last you know six to eight years that the ground's getting tired. Uh, even with all of the added inputs of compost, biology, slow release, you know, all the best farm practices still just can't get that soil back to where it needs to be. And um, that was really the biggest push. Also too, obviously, with the losses of certain uh, chemicals and, and things like that, we're seeing a lot of uh, pathogens and, and more diseases coming back into the industry, not just with um, our regions, but also where the runners come from. So we're, we're increasingly seeing all of that um, coming in now and things that, you know, Dad's saying we haven't seen for a really long time are all sort of starting to show their head again. So um, we're losing a lot of plants, um, yield is down, um, fruit quality is just not as good and our season's obviously becoming a lot shorter. So we, we uh, historically used to 
kick into uh, end of October, early November, sometimes even um, late November, early December. For you know, about 15 years ago, that would be the norm for us. Um, now we are lucky if we can get through into October or uh, middle of October and have the fruit quality size and um, and plant health that we need to do that. So we've lost about four to six weeks of our season over the last sort of 10 years. That's gradually gotten shorter and shorter. So that was the, the biggest um, reason we went that way. And also to, you know, dad's been growing for 45 years. My sister and my sisters and I have taken over the farm and um, we're second generation. So we had to start thinking a little bit outside the box. If we want to still farm for another 20, 25 years, how can we do that um, without having to, you know, go and buy new land or or do all of that stuff and still stay where we are, so. Yeah, fantastic. And so, Laura, you guys have just finished your second season now under the, um, the open tabletops. Um, how's it going? Anything you observed over the last two years? <laughs> so, um, it's been interesting, honestly. Um, it's been a big challenge for us, but um, the, the biggest things uh, we've sort of noticed, to be honest, is the quality of the fruit that we can get. Obviously, um, it's a challenge still. Uh, we have very, like I said before, we have really high expectation on, on fruit quality and um, our ground quality has always been um, quite exceptional. Dad's always done a really great job. So we found that it's been uh, actually a big challenge for us in tables to sort of um, mirror that, that quality, to be honest. Yeah. And anything in particular now that, you know, two years down the track that you would like to have done differently given um, the knowledge you have now? Uh, look, the, the first year for us, we did the 3.3 hectares and that was really, we just threw it in, thought, what are we going to do? Uh, we did do a lot of um, investigating with what inputs we needed. You know, we've got a pre dosing system actually. Um, we got a, a lot of good, really good advice when uh, we we went to do to do that. Um, what would I? What would we do differently? Well, we would really probably, I would probably get a bit more knowledge about nutrient and like all the things that um, Marcus was talking about. You know, uh, the balance is crucial with nutrition for substrate. Uh, we're obviously learning that over the second the second season. Uh, we've we're not, we haven't mastered it, but I believe that we've come a long way uh, with knowing what and when it needs it. Um, but obviously with outdoor tables, it's even more of a challenge for us because we're, we're fighting those elements. Um, so I'd probably get a bit more knowledge about nutrition and, and what they need. Um, and table heights, row widths, all of those things are important. Um, getting, you know, and spray units, all, all of that, like I'll probably, we went in really quickly because we had some some blocks that needed to either rest or not grow in. And so when we went in, we went in quite quickly. We made a decision in a short few weeks of, oh, yep, this is what we're going to do. So I'd probably allow myself a little bit more time to, to get ready, to be honest. But um, we got thrown under the bus and, and we've managed to make it work, I feel. And, um, yeah, so just really do the research is what I would say. <laughs> Look, if anyone's got questions, please feel free to add them through. Um, Scott's actually just asked a question of you, Laura, uh, and he's very interested in about how in a open uh, tabletop structure that you guys are operating on without the tunnel, how you manage EC within your bags? Oh, good question. <laughs> so uh, we have to be really, really um, on the money with what our weather's doing. So. Uh, if, if we're going to get rain events or other things, then we need to make sure that we're allowing for um, higher inputs for that periods of time. Uh, Marcus will contest to this that um, pH is also a bit of a challenge. So for us, we've found that we've had to, um, yeah, increase our EC, um, shorter dosings uh, more regularly, just uh, in those weather events to allow allow that to be there. But you know, as as the problem is they're not really transpiring that, that massively during that period of rain. So we've always just had to try and allow, you know, that nutrient there even in those sort of environment, you know, those conditions. So still all learning, like I said, um, second year in, still really no major idea. Um, it's all new, even for Dad, you know, it's 
completely different than uh, ground production. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And Laura, just another question's come through. It might be relevant to yourself or Scott. Um, do you have a percentage increase figure for year up in substrate now that you're out of production? Sorry, you just broke up then, Clinton. What was that? Sorry about that. Um, do you have any increase, any indication of the increase in yield you have now in substrates rather than in field production? Uh, for us, um, we we've always sort of grown our ground crop with only about thirty seven thousand plants per hectare. So we've always spread ours out probably more than most of the um, industry, to be honest. So we've managed to uh, double the amount of plants that we put in and essentially increase our yield by by that. Um, we've had challenges with with certain things as well. So the numbers aren't in for this year. Um, it's the first year that we've actually done full season production and I'm in the processes of working all that out. But I, I definitely do know that the plants um, are doing a lot better now in the tables than what they were in our ground production. So I would say that our yield has definitely increased um, considering you know what we've sort of been dealing with over the last five years with the soil soil problems. So yeah. Um, maybe, maybe check with Scott and Gabby if you guys have got any experience with yeah. percentage increase. One one thing I'd I'd probably state is that you don't necessarily get more yield per plant, but what you definitely get is a is a much much higher yield per hectare because um, sure. obviously your plant densities are going to be a lot higher, more like. Thousand compared to say forty thousand. Um, the other thing worth considering is that if you've got a farm of I don't know just uh, ten hectares and you, and every year you're resting two or three hectares, um, the quickest way you can increase the production on that farm is just to go to hydro and not rest anything. Um, so yeah. if you're looking at you know capital value in land or trying to get more out of you know a pack house on that land or or all the efficiencies you get with, you know, more output and total volume, then hydroponics is probably the fastest way to achieve that. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Fantastic. I just might check in with Angela and Jen if there's been any other questions come through to either of yourselves. Um. Hi, Angela. So I just had one come through about for Laura. Um, she mentioned uh, concerns about diseases coming from the runner growers. I wondered if they'd had much experience using plug plants, not me, the text that came through, um, using plug plants as their material. Uh, yeah, so predominantly our tables actually have uh, plug uh, plants in them. Uh, the runner grower that we actually source from has now um, implemented their plug production is fully um, soilless. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll get better control with all of that from, from now on. Obviously, we're all learning in, in Australia in regards to all of this. So um, we still did see a little, you know, the pathogens and things, but that's because mother stock and plants were taken from soil production. Uh, that won't be the case this season. Everything will be uh, from fresh stock, not, not touched in soil. Uh, so I think we're going to have a lot more control. Uh, Phytophthora, obviously we grow a variety that a lot of people don't really tend to grow much anymore is Fortuna. Uh, we love the fruit, all of that, but the biggest problem is uh, Phytophthora. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, by implementing plug plants and the plug runner grow or well, the runner growers doing the same thing in soilless uh, production, then we're going to have great success with that. So um, it's very promising, really. It's exciting times. Fantastic. A great question has been by um, John Frasina from the Landmark in relation to the cost of pest management. Laura, I might start with yourself in Queensland. I know you guys have noted a bit of a challenge with Queensland fruit fly um, in the tabletop. So you've got anything, comments to add on? change the pest and disease management and cost associated with that? I, I love how you said mild, In you know. <laughs> we basically got uh, really slaughtered, to be honest, in tables in comparison to our ground crop. Uh, fruit fly probably was our biggest challenge for the year. Uh, we were very vigilant uh, with protein baiting and a lot of other inputs that we've um, trialled this year. And, and 
I feel like I would love to say that with great success, but I, it isn't the case. Um, we really need to be working hard, I think, as an industry to uh, do a bit of R&D around the fruit, the fruit fly issue, um, especially with uh, this being the future. They tend to love the, the tables uh, more than the ground. We have both uh, on Belmere with the neighbours having ground crops still. And um, yeah, so fruit fly challenges and costs, uh, you know, to, to protein bait and um, mail trap and do all of that. It's just astronomical. And um, we feel like it just hasn't had, we haven't had a good enough result uh, for the money that Bent, to be honest. Yeah, okay. Um, and Scott and Gabby, just a final thought on you in regards to cost of managing pests in the tunnels. Uh, yeah, in, inside tunnels, it's obviously a lot more expensive uh, because what we, we've, we've done in the past is use Aureus. Um, you're a brave grower if you don't, I think, use Aureus uh, in tunnels um, in the southern regions where it gets really hot and dry and dusty um, because Western Flower Thrip just absolutely loves it. Um, mm. That would be absolutely one tip if you were going to do anything. As soon as you see an open flower, get some cucumis and aureus into your strawberries um, if you're in a protected cropping environment. Um, but yeah, also it's it's drier, it's hotter, um, and if you're growing strawberries under a tunnel, powdery mildew is your your next issue, which means you want to limit your sprinklers. And keep your plant dry, so then you're really um, you're kind of up against it with uh, two spot mite as well. So you kind of you take away botrytis and any sort of maybe other problems, and you you do open the uh, open the door for some other issues. But um, but yeah, it's definitely a higher cost when it comes to IPM in tunnels and strawberries in Victoria. And Gabby might speak to that too. Uh, I guess I would like to add, Scott is absolutely right on all the various issues that she mentioned. The only thing what I want to add, IPM is the key. I don't think mm -hmm. someone can uh, run this production uh, with high density and high intensity production without IPM. Another very important, I think, thing uh, is monitoring, M understanding your IPM bugs and understanding your crops and monitoring is correctly on an almost daily basis. That's what we do here. It's very, very crucial, especially when it's uh, all the processes, like I said, it's intensive. It's coming much faster than the field. So if you see today one mite, one mite maybe in the field you, you have still some time to react. In the tunnels, you need to react fast. So the key is to have high quality people who will monitor and uh, maybe use the advice of IPM guys, their professional advice. But it's another very important key for success. Uh, yeah, and I have to agree. With John. Um, you might discuss this with John. Uh, we have new materials uh, that come into the work, like transform, for example. Uh, and we need, oh, yes, but it kills Aureus. So you always need to be very, very careful what chemicals you're using and where and how. Plus, uh, as I said, monitoring. This is, from my point of view, the keys for successful uh, pest eradication program. Fantastic. Well, look, Gabby, I appreciate that and really thank your times and Scott's there at Sunny Ridge and also Laura and Taste and See. Uh, and a big special thanks to Marcus as well from Priva and also his um, due patience as well to cope with those technical issues earlier. Look, everyone, thank you very much for your involvement, participation and active engagement with this webinar. It's been great to have this discussion with you all. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available on the Strawberry Innovation website and a link will come out in the next edition of The Punnet. Um, so please feel free to shoot around to those um, who may have missed this session um, or if you'd like to watch any of the discussion again. Um, and we'll also include some details and links to Marcus's contact details for any follow-up questions from there. But again, thanks everyone again for your contribution, your time today, um, and all the best um, as you go on with your day today. Cheers.